Hello again. Didn't think I'd be back so soon. Um, I want to talk today about Jonathan Wedger. I know everyone's talking about Jonathan Wedger lately and much of it is uncomplimentary. Um, however, I think it's about time we talked about Wedger and the Hampstead case since he seems to have brought it up recently as well. And what I would like to know, um, I know people are asking him questions about his most recent interviewee, um, a woman named uh, Jeanette Archer? Jeanette Archer, I believe that's correct. And asking about, you know, the, per the allegations that she has made about babies being buried and so forth. But I would like to know something else. I would like to know why Jonathan Wedger was very well aware of the Hampstead case in September of 2014, before it went public. He knew all about it. And yet, he did not choose to say anything about it openly until last month. What's going on? And why now? So I want to tell you a little bit about how Wedger was involved with the Hampstead case because I think it's important. I think it's important for you to realize that he may kind of look a bit on the goofy side, but I think he's got a game plan in mind and I don't think it's one that is necessarily in the best interests of children. Um, okay, so we all know that in September of 2014, um, on the 4th of September, Abraham and Ella brought the two children, Ab Ella's two children, back from Morocco. They had spent the previous month basically beating the living daylights out of the children until they could recite short videos of allegations against their father, their teachers, uh, their schoolmates, um, their social workers, pretty much everyone and his dog in, in Hampstead was named. Um, actually, there were no dogs named. Oversight, perhaps. Anyhow, the first person that they contact when they get back, they didn't, they didn't go straight to the police. Don't even think that they would think such a thing. The first person they talked to was Brian Garish. Why? Well, because they felt that Garish would be able to help them publicize their story. So right away, you see that they're not interested in justice for the children. They're not interested in, you know, helping the kids get away from this alleged satanic cult, even though, by the way, the kids never mentioned the word Satan, just saying. Um, what they're most interested in is having the thing publicized. So then that evening, Abraham takes the children to visit his brother-in-law, Jean Clément Yohiru. Now Jean Clément was, possibly still is, I don't know, a special constable with Metropolitan Police. Now absolutely no, ris no disrespect to him meant, but a special constable is not a real police officer. It is a volunteer position. You don't, you, you basically sign up for it and you get to help the police. And that's great. That's a fantastic thing to do for those who are able to do it. Um, however, apparently, despite his long as your leg um, criminal background, Abraham, who ought to have known better because he'd had plenty of dealings with police, apparently didn't grasp that Jean Clément was not going to be able to run their case. And in fact, it's pretty clear that Abraham realized that he could bully Jean Clément, because you hear him doing it in the audio that Jean Clément made, and that he would be able to run the case through Jean Clément. So that's a nice little setup. You basically go home, tell your brother-in-law who you think is a cop, even though he's not, you dumbass, and then you think, well, I'll just be able to run it and, and he'll, you know, he'll do everything I want and it'll all work out exactly as I want it to. Anyway, so on that 
same day, or sorry, I'm sorry, I'm sorry I'm, that's, they, they take the kids to see Jean Clément. They go, go home, it's about midnight. So on the 5th of September, first thing in the morning, Jean Clément notifies Scotland Yard of what his brother-in-law has been saying and what the children have said because he's quite justifiably alarmed by it. One way or another, something bad is going on, um, and he knows it, so that's fine. So the police arrived at Abraham and Ella's house, much to their surprise and chagrin. They were not pleased to see them, and that's noticed, you know, made note of in the um, police report on the matter. They're they're not thrilled to see the police, and they don't initially want to let them in, um, because this is not going according to plan. This was the first real hiccup that they had encountered. At, on the same day, Jean Clément emails the police um, a, an email which had been sent to him by Abraham or Ella, we're not sure which, probably Ella, because it, um, it reads like she wrote it, but who knows. Um, and it outlines the alleged abuse, who was supposed to have done it, what was supposed to have happened, where it was supposed to have happened, etc. So Jean Clément emails this to the police and they receive it and put it into the file and go like, okay, thanks very much, that's cool, and continue with the investigation. Um, now, a few days after that, on th they have the first set of interviews with the children, and the children basically tell them more or less the same things that they said in the videos that they were forced to make on the way home from Morocco. Um, there are some, you know, discrepancies and so forth but you know they're little kids and what do you expect so on the 11th of September so this is six days after the initial contact with the police um, Brian Garish receives an email from Ella it is the identical email that she sent to uh, Jean Clément who sent it to the police Garish sees this email and for whatever reason sends it to his friend Bill Maloney. Bill Maloney passes it to Jonathan Wedger who is his friend. So now all three of them know what the allegations are. And we have to presume that for some reason none of them wanted to touch it. Why? Well, probably the best rationale for that is that uh, Brian Garish had met Abraham and he knew who he was dealing with. He knew where this was coming from. He had been informed ahead of time that it was going to happen. And now that it was happening and he saw everything laid out, it became pretty clear to him that this was not something that he was really going to want to get involved in unless he was really, really looking forward to having the police knocking on his door. Um, and so he, I believe, probably passed that message on to Bill Maloney, who passed it on to Jonathan Wedger. Wedger, God bless his cotton socks, sent the email to a friend of his at the police. Now, he didn't use his, um, his police... Uh, email address. He used his personal one, which was something like numbnutswedger at whatever. Um, and so for quite some time afterwards, um, Abraham ranted and raved about how Maloney had abandoned them and Garish had abandoned them, and it was all because of the infamous police informant numbnutswedger. Clearly, he had no frickin' clue who Jonathan Wedger was. Not a clue. Um, but he decided that he was an informant. Um, like, well, I suppose in a sense he was. Uh, but anyhow, so that email made its way from Garish to Maloney to Wedger to the Met, and it was and it was landed up on the desk of the officer who was running the uh, investigation. And at that point, the police kind of had already taken the children into custody uh, because they knew that Abraham had been hitting them. And 
when they received that, I'm going to guess that having received one document on the 5th of September and one document on the 11th of September, one from the original informant who was Jean Clément and one from a notorious conspiracy promoter, Brian Garish, at, via Maloney, via Wedger, they put two and two together and went, gosh, I think two and two might make four. I mean, not that they wouldn't have guessed this already because there were a lot of, there was a lot of evidence that um, what the children were saying just didn't hold up. Many, many, many things. And we, we've gone into this before, so I'm not going to repeat it. So Wedger knew. We know he knew. He was involved with Garish. Garish knew. He was involved with Maloney. Maloney knew. And yet none of them said a word until after Sabine McNeil released the videos in early 2015. Well, it was late 2015, late 2014, rather early 2015, um, and began promoting them and then tried to use them to blackmail a judge, but that's a whole other kettle of fish. So I think probably by the time Sabine had released the videos, it was okay for Garish and possibly even Maloney to get involved. You might remember that Maloney turned up at the uh, at the church during the demonstrations, and you know rah rah rah, you know anti child abuse blah blah blah. Um, so why would they do that then, but not at the time of the actual allegations being made? Pretty simple. <laughs> because they weren't going to take the heat for it. it was, if, if anyone was going to take the heat, it was going to be Sabine McNeil, and that is, in fact, exactly what happened. She is now serving time in prison for her part in essentially destroying the lives of many families in Hampstead. And we're not just talking about the dad and the children. We're talking about a number of families whose lives were thrown upside down by this thing. Um, the people that no one thinks about when they talk about it. We know that that all happened. So what's the, so what's the big deal? Why, why am I questioning this? Well, what I want to know is given that Wedger was very well aware of the Hampstead case and knew as much as anyone else about it at the very beginning and was aware of who Abraham was and what he was like, I'm presuming, because he was in contact with Maloney and Garish, who were tight like that. So why only speak out now? Well, a couple of things. One, he probably didn't want anyone putting two and two together and saying, oh gosh, weren't you the guy that sent it to the police? Um, and secondly, he probably thinks that at this point the coast is clear enough that if he plays his cards right, he can use this story to bump up his own self-image and, and get, get money for his non-existent charity. Um, the John Wedger Foundation, as we have pointed out, is neither a foundation nor a business. It is a low-level charity with no accountability whatsoever to anyone except for Mr. Wedger. Um, and yeah, I think it's pretty clear that, you know, the, um, the thing that motivates him at the moment and that is pushing him to churn out video after video is the good old green stuff, the money, you know. And I think it's important for people to realize that he knew a lot at the beginning and chose to say nothing. That's not, if he believed in satanic ritual abuse and he believed what the children said was true, would he really have kept silent all of these years? Would he? I don't think so. I really don't. So that's it for me for now. I just thought I'd throw that out there and see what people had to think about it. Um, yeah, I will 
you know, be happy to answer questions, chat, you know, the usual. Okay, so take care. Bye now.